So the first speaker is uh, Emeline Pouillet, and her background is a little bit different from the previous three speakers because she has uh, a PhD in, uh, in um, physics, and she did this uh, at the beam line at the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility in Grenoble. And she is uh, presently as a state scientist at the Center for Scientific Studies in Arts and University of Northwestern Chicago. So please. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for having me today. So I'm going to present you some of the results we obtained on uh, one of the paintings uh, that has been painted by Picasso during the Blue Period, which is named La Misosa Coupi. And I'm going to present you both in situ and microanalysis that have been realized on samples. Before I do so, I just wanted to give a brief kind of introduction or a few words on what was the framework in which we've done this work. Um, so the Center for Scientific Studies in the Arts is based in Chicago. And one of his main uh, mission is actually to provide access to cultural uh, heritage institutions, but as well to researchers, um, to different type of scientific tools or scientific expertise. So the way it actually works is that two times within the year, researcher or institution can uh, apply for uh, what we call the external project proposal. You write basically five pages with a research question, and this goes under review. If this gets accepted, then your the research is funded for a year, basically. Uh, this is in this framework that this work has been done at the Art Gallery of Ontario. So I wanted to introduce the main person who made this study actually possible, who are Sandra Webster-Cook and uh, Kenneth Bremer, who are the curator and conservator at the Art Gallery of Ontario. We started this whole research about two paintings, part of their collection, that will be exhibited in 2020 on, uh, for an exhibition on the Blue Period of Picasso. So the, the overall goal of this scientific study of the two paintings was actually to develop an adapted uh, in-situ and microinvasive uh, scientific uh, study of those paintings for an improved understanding of the materials and techniques in Picasso's early work, and also to better understand his creative process and how he makes changes and transformation uh, within his paintings. So I should uh, mention that this work haven't been done by only a few people. So my, this is my colleague Gianluca Pastorelli, who was a postdoc at the center, who also helped for this uh, as analysis. And this is Francesca Casadillo, who is uh, the director of the Center for Scientific Studies in the Art. During this work, we also had the chance to work with John Delaney, who is here in the audience, uh, from the National Gallery of Art in Washington. We realized some of the in-situ analysis that I'm going to present today. So I am not going to give you an introduction on the Blue Period because I feel like you are most more knowledgeable than I am. Um, but I still find it fascinating that wherever they are valued for their homogeneous formal repertoire and uh, unified tonality, they are actually very complex, multi-layered structure. And this is very fascinating to me. And I think when we exhibit, exhibit this type of work, this is something we need to acknowledge the history of these paintings that might not be directly accessible by the naked eye. And here are just a few examples on how different composition changes can be found in this early work that are very informative, either in the history of the painting or in the uh, understanding of the creative process of the artist itself. So the painting I'm going to really focus uh, my talk about is the Miserosa Coupi that I'm showing uh, here. And this is part of the Blue Period uh, uh, painting of Picasso from 1902. And as you can see, this is also a very good example of this multi-layered structure. So here is an extra radiograph that has been taken at the Art Gallery. Uh, almost like 15 years ago. So if you flip it, sorry, 90 degrees clockwise, wonderful landscape appeared. So most of the scholars agree to basically say that this landscape was not painted by Picasso. And one of the reasons for that is that the format of the painting and the format of the landscape do not match what we would expect from Picasso at that time. And this is open to discussion. Um, something, however, that has been uh, kind of observed very recently is actually when you overlap the shape of the woman who is this kind of hill background, you see that some of the line of her back actually match the shape of the earlier composition. 
And I think this is pretty unique in the sense that these are very early work of Picasso reusing the canvas of a possible other artist while keep while at the same time keeping like visual clues of what lies underneath. So I mean these are I mean there is more here than just saying there was another composition underneath as it can have possibly inspired the artist itself. So in order to better understand some of the visual changes, in particular of the shape, I mean, surface shape of the painting, some photometric stereo were acquired at the surface of the painting. So here I'm showing two areas that are flipped 90 degrees clockwise, and we can see some of the detail actually that were present in the landscape, so such as the colon that is here in the legs, and the temple that is here on the uh, formal left uh, shoulder of the woman. However, some other uh, change in the surface shape appear that do not like, like they are um, coming from this underlying landscape. So these are primary uh, observation that another underpainting or underlying uh, structure exists underneath these visible, these uh, misereuses which are on in the area of the uh, proper right arm of the woman. So in order to better imagine and understand what was going on here we perform two types of in-situ analysis. So the first one is the diffuse infrared reflectance imaging that uh, John performed at the gallery, I think, a couple of years ago. Um, and here you can see that you have a camera that records the reflectance of the painting in the near infrared range, for, so from 970 to 1670. And this is a range of a wavelength that is pretty interesting because it allows you to go deeper than the surface layers and so see a little bit deeper than what you can see with the visible light. More interestingly, because this is a hyperspectral uh, system, you can also look at absorption shape in, within this near infrared region, and this might be informative of the material that the artists have used. So as an example, the red arrow is pointing out an area where uh, lead carbonate is used in a high uh, amount, and the uh, blue arrow is pointed uh, in an area where Prussian blue is used in a high amount. So we can kind of use this absorption profile to uh, help defining which are the pigments that are used. Uh, so here I put together the map that has been obtained by looking at specific uh, burn characteristic of the use of lead white uh, using the hyperspectral data set and I compare it with the information we had from the radiography. And here are, is the same uh, area pointed green of the zoom uh, region of the proper right arm of the woman. So as you can see, we can now identify clearly that fingers were there from the very beginning, even in their X radiography, but that nobody mentioned as well. Um, interestingly, there is also circular shape and the presence of a kind of arm underneath. However, we, we have some kind of visibility issue in the case of the radiograph. Uh, clearly, the stretching mark prevents us to see what's going on in this area. And in the hyperspectral data set, some pigments that are very still absorbing in this kind of near-infrared region prevent us to see what's going on on the left side. And we would like also to obtain more information about what type of pigments are mixed and how they are mixed to create this underlying structure. So this is where we came into the game and we bring our XRF equipment. So that's a commercial equipment, the Helio mapper, right? The only issue that we had was the fact that we can map and image only a small area, which is a 10 by 10 centimeter square. The painting is a meter by 60 centimeters. So that's not really the same scale of analysis. So in order to be able to access the whole painting, we built a scanning stage. We tested it in our laboratory and we ship it to the museum in order to be able to analyze the whole um, composition of La Miseuse. And this is how it looks when it's all installed and not running, of course. Um, very quickly, just for those of you who are not used to uh, XRF mapping, um, so the way it works is actually we shoot X-ray and uh, to the surface of the painting and rec record the X-ray first and signal coming out of this painting. We do that in mapping mode, which means that for each single uh, square here, we acquire a full spectrum. And then we look at one specific energy that corresponds directly to an atomic number, so to an atom. And using this uh, integration for each of the pigments, we can map actually the presence of this element. So for example, here iron, where it looks whiter, this is where you have more. 
and uh, you can do that for the series of peaks that you are seeing in this picture. So, because these are in-situ techniques, one of the limitations we may have is to really being able to separate the different layers and signal coming from those different layers. So we still took four samples within the, within the frame of uh, La Miseruse, but we took them after we did the in-situ analysis. So which means that the in-situ analysis informed us on where we took the sample to really best answer the question we had about layering information. So here um, I'm presenting the results we obtained from the in-situ techniques and on the microsamples. On microsample, we did SEMEDS, we did microdiffraction, and we did microFTIR for a clear uh, identification of the pigments that are used. So on this side, I'm presenting you the result we obtained from what I call the visible layer, so what we can observe from our naked eye. Uh, what we can see that Picasso is uh, using a mixture of Prussian blue and uh, bone black in order to create the dark blue and dark contour of the woman. He is using Prussian blue uh, for the, the blue uh, decoration, so no presence of ultramarine. However, the Prussian blue is mixed with different types of fillers, so barium white, gypsum, and we also see bone black in the kind of darker area again. The green are also very interesting. They are a mixture of cadmium yellow, lead chromate, and viridian, as well as Prussian blue. So you can see I haven't shown the map of lead, and one of the reasons for that is basically because the lead uh, is very characteristic of this underlying structure, luckily for us. Um, in this area, we can clearly identify, again, the presence of those fingers and the circular shape. And what was pretty amazing when we did that scan is that as soon as the scan was done, Ken came back to us with this watercolor, and he was like, I think we found another uh, miseros. And having this kind of awkward position of the hand, I should say, because we spent a little bit of time trying to understand how she was actually holding this circular shape that we think is a bread now. Um, but this is a watercolor that has been made by Picasso, who is now privately on unfortunately, so we don't have access to it. But just to show that this was, I mean, there is a clear link with other work, with other materials that uh, are done at the same period uh, by Picasso. So again, we took, we have the sample and we are now looking at this intermediate layer. And within this intermediate layer, we actually have different type of pigments that were present. So clearly for the flesh tone, and this is not Amazing, but the flesh and are a mixture of lead white and vermilion, right? Um, but something that was uh, very interesting was to see that the contour of the fingers were still present and are very rich in iron. In that case, in order to make sure that this is still Prussian blue that he's using for the contour, we actually combine this map of the XRF with the mapping obtained from the hyperspectra, which is here where we can still image the presence of the Prussian blue in this contour of the fingers. Interestingly as well, what you can see, I think, easily in the lead and mercury map is the kind of missing area that we see here. So when we look at the photometric stereo at the very beginning, this area was very clear as it looked as a negative kind of shape. So it looks that this area has been actually scrapped away by the artist himself explaining why we now see the zinc that is coming from the layer under and is present into the landscape. But again, very interesting is that if you start to overlap your iron map or the Prussian uh, map that we see here, we see that in the area of the finger, there is actually another shape that is this extra finger on the top. So now we can start to even try to reconstruct what was actually the creative process where he started to paint these four fingers that we see here scrapped away the surface in the area where we have the lack of lead and mercury, <laughs> and then repaint another finger on top of it slightly with a slightly different orientation, but then decided to cover it up again. And also something that was uh, pretty interesting to me compared with the other painting we analyzed is the fact that we identify the presence of transium yellow and barium yellow. Uh, whereas in all the other uh, blue pair that we've seen, I've seen mostly cadmium yellow and lead chromate. So I don't know if you have other example of this use of yellow in the early work, but I would be interested to learn more about that. Um, now let's go to the last 
kind of paint layer, or at least original canvas, and how it looks like. Um, in this uh, primary composition, we got also lucky enough that heavy elements were there, so we were easily able to image them. And these heavy elements were mercury, cadmium, and zinc. Uh, so the hill were painted with the mixture of cadmium-based uh, pigment and mercury-based pigment. The sky was very rich in mercury, and actually we took a uh, cross-section in one of the edge of the canvas, and as you can see, this layer is rich in, in vermilion. However, we haven't identified yet the coring agent in the purple area. Um, so this is as far we've gone for this original canvas, I mean, original composition. And then we looked at the canvas. So for the ground, uh, we identify mostly uh, lead carbonate, I mean, lead white, uh, mixed with a little bit of calcium sulfite. And uh, for the canvas itself, linen fibers have been identified. And there is a thread counting that is uh, ongoing right now, also to compare with other uh, blue period painting from the same period. However, the identity of this primarily artist is still unknown, um, but there is a lot of research that is uh, going on now to identify the place where this landscape uh, might have been painted, or at least the place that might have inspired this uh, earlier landscape. And I think you, for the local people, you might, re I mean, you might recognize the park that is in picture here. Um, and that is uh, one proposition that is being made right now that this uh, landscape is actually inspired by the Limbiris uh, Park of Arta. Uh, and this is also an interesting fact as uh, in 1902, this park was not easily accessible, so that was privately owned, which means that the earlier artists who made this composition had specific access to this place. So with this, I would like to thank all the people who participated to this work and welcome any question you have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So in... What do you think about the, you know, the technique that he used, the non-invasive technique that he used for, for you know, trying to understand the composition of the different layers, I mean, different paintings? Um, do you think it would be useful having uh, a technique which was mainly focused on the, you know, the, the, the layers that are now visible so that then you can use the XR, XR, uh, F data for trying to separate the contribution from the two uh, paintings or? So that's uh, a good question. So we can already do some of this work already from the XRF data, right? Because depending on the line of and the, the, the different energy, I mean, the line of uh, emission of the fluorescent and you are looking at, you can already choose some that are a low in energy, so very uh, specific from the surface layer, and some that came from deeper that have uh, higher energy. So this is typically what you will do for lead. Uh, so layer separation is not as easy because XRF is a nonlinear technique, meaning that if you don't have a good understanding of what is present into your paint layer and possibly of the thickness of this layer, then really doing this uh, layer separation become a real trick. However, I think that what can be done, and I think these are also the next step for this institute techniques, is like we can fuse the different modalities and play with how uh, these different modalities see different thickness into the material uh, in order to do this, um, this kind of peeling of the paintings. But I still think that sampling is mandatory for some area, but I really think that institute analysis should be used first to guide where we are gonna take these samples. <laughs> 